everyone, and um, and welcome to the North uh, South podcast with myself, Kieran Khan, and I'm Cameron Archibald. So, um, so today our topics are going to be um, the job guarantee, uh, which is a policy that uh, that Cameron has been working on over over in Scotland, and um, and we are going to also be talking about um, universal basic income, which has been a very um, very hot topic um, considering the outbreak uh, of COVID, and uh, we just want to. Wish everyone well before we start with the podcast. Uh, wish everyone well in lockdown, and I hope everyone is staying safe, uh, staying home, and um, and um, following social distancing. And now on with the program. Brilliant program! I like it. That was, that was very, <laughs> ooh, very BBC like there. Um, I guess we're going to go off the, the job guarantee first. I guess because I mean that's the kind of thing I've been working yeah. with just yeah. now. Um, so for those who don't know, um, there's a kind of a slight, de- I mean, it's like a debate between the job guarantee and UBI. I think, though, there's a, a kind of good kind of vibe because both sides actually share the same values and similar beliefs and want to kind of build a more kind of green, uh, unionized, uh, progressive sort of society where it's down to kind of a localized economic model. Um, how that's done, though, is kind of there's different view there. So I think we'll start with the job guarantee. I think a lot of people think the job guarantee and they think it's kind of some evil Stalinist sort of forcing everyone into a job and yeah. showing people into gulag and stuff like that. But it's actually just a lot more simpler than that. Um, basically, the job guarantee is basically an employer of last resort, right. which effectively is that the state, the government or a local government uh, will provide those who seek a job a job uh, how that's modeled uh, can be modeled in various different ways but that is fundamentally what it is it's a, basically it's universalism for jobs how you have the right to health care the right to education you also have the right to employment yeah um and that's actually a big part of because uh, you know like in, right now in the u.s you have alexandria ocasio cortez yeah and bernie sanders who are pushing for the, the green new deal for them it's one of the fundamental pillars uh, to do a Green New Deal and this has actually been done in the past through various different models including by Martin Luther King but we'll get to him in a bit yeah. but I think the more important aspect though is that under our current human rights uh, article 23 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights it states everyone has the right to work to the free choice of employment uh, and to just and favorable conditions and protection against unemployment. Now, we kind of have protection in regards to the welfare state uh, against uh, the effects of unemployment. Um, we do have the free choice of employment that's available in the free market, but we don't actually have protection from unemployment itself. If you're unemployed, you're guaranteed unemployment. You're not actually given a right to a job unless yeah. the private sector uh, is willing to be kind enough to offer you that, even when it's trying to hit profit margins. But that's not how it works. So the profit, you know, the private sector aims for profit margins, not to try and uh, tackle surplus labor. So right there, Article Twenty Three of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights isn't really being tackled the way people should be tackling it. It really should be an under, you know, should be a, a very bare minimum right for everyone overall uh, did, you, did you know about that yourself about that art that specific right yeah um, no i didn't actually that is actually very um interesting to find out about so um so what my understanding of the job guarantee is obviously obviously right now right now in the uk you aren't guaranteed to employment and um and uh, and uh, and the current and the current welfare system uh with um with more people going 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 onto universal credit it is kind of um it, it is kind of driving poverty up a bit and um and and like not all communities um not 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 all communities really have uh, like the resources to um to basically like take care of themselves and stuff like that so yeah i think one important point about poverty is that people assume that if you're in work you are not in poverty yeah but you have in work poverty where yeah. even though you have an income even though you have you live in a certain household the household itself may not actually to health standards the housing standards and to today's uh, standards and also the income may not be actually enough to support yourself or even if you have uh, family members within the household as well yeah i uh, know yeah we've um we've seen 
we've seen in work poverty like going up over the last 10 years and and we and we haven't seen the minimum wage um going up as nearly as nearly as much as it should be and considering like when it comes to like the living wage as well like not like not every worker is being is being paid the the, the national living wage which is just a complete scandal yeah and that's actually um, another point as well, because uh, the job guarantee actually sets uh, a bare minimum standard. So if the job guarantee program, the kind of model I'm going off is that I will set about 37 hours a week max, but you can also do part time as well within that. Um, I say modeling off because I'm doing a paper of Commonweal on this and also on with other think tank, Modern Money Scotland, uh, which I'm helping leading. Um, but also as well, um, if you have 37 hours a week, if you offer the living wage or a uh, negotiated wage which could be done with unions so it can be above 10 pounds an hour um and also offers flexible contracts so workers are not stuck in a continuous long cycle of compl- of constant labor uh, with low income and that sets the the minimum it's, like a, it's almost like a minimum wage but it's actually like a you know a living wage but it's like a minimum job uh structure basically and the private sector has to match that and if they don't match that and they can't meet those conditions then they're not working uh to in the favor of labor and also people's uh, yeah. lifestyles and that's what it essentially is it's not just income it's about the the overall uh, experience of being a labor in the workforce um and yeah. there's a few there's a few well there's a few examples of that in itself like um argentina for example they had a program called the i'm probably gonna butcher this uh the jeff jesse Jeff S. A. Hogar program. I think that's how you pronounce it. Not Argentina. Who knows? Who knows if you'll even be pronouncing it properly? But that doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, if if you're Argentinian uh, and you, if I butcher that, I apologize. <laughs> if you're there, please correct me. But basically, what that did was that um, basically that cost about only one percent of GDP in terms of spending on that, yeah. and it had hired nearly two million people in the program. And after about four months, the poverty rate uh, had fallen from 25% to yeah. 18%. And that was just within four months. If that had a longer term uh, program, that would have been far more successful. But also as well, uh, the job guarantee also, because it, obviously when it comes to labor and employment, women are vastly underrepresented in some sectors. But when it came to the GFS program, it actually accounted for 64% of women who were participants overall and mm-hmm. uh, therefore that's another thing as well it raises certain groups to present great representation for them opportunities to take part uh, in the workforce and to actually seek uh, responsibilities and also seek uh, work in which matches their skills or other um, and when it comes to this uh, to this the Argentinian program I had an over 90 percent uh, positive satisfaction rate uh, and with that um, you know, 93% of those who were in the job guarantee program in Argentina, 93% went back into the private sector afterwards when the, progr- uh, the program was ended. Mm. Uh, and they were receiving wages over 150 pesos, which at the time was above what they were earning in general. Um, now, the overall impact of that was that w- when you include the multiplier effect, um, which was, I think it was about 2.5%, uh, 1, 1.8 million part of the program of each person earning 150 pesos per month, in which that meant that uh, the overall economy grew by 8.327 billion pesos, which is about 2.49% of GDP. So it had some fantastic economic benefits there, but also as well, it was people-oriented work that was doing and also bringing up other groups with them are not leaving vulnerable groups behind yeah i would um i would love to see uh was trade unions um tr- trade unions get more involved with this obviously because um because of all my work within the labor party and all my work over the over over the last couple of years like working on the sports direct campaign a campaign and working on a increased increase in the minimum wage campaign i i think um if we were if we were going to do something like this um i do think trade unions um should definitely be involved as well and um and and obviously the labor party is really heavily involved in the trade unions and they're really involved in workers rights and uh, so so that with the guarantee like what uh like what workers rights do you think would be guaranteed with that and stuff uh, i think Current, I think it's not about. Uh, it was more for the extension of current workers' rights. I'd say right now, uh, I'd say that it's 
the program itself is, is purely an impairment of extension. So the right to income, the right to employment, uh, the, the right to a healthy lifestyle, the right to uh, negotiation of wages and with itself. I mean, this purely depends on how it's modeled though. Um, just to touch on the fact that you talked about um, the union, uh, unions getting involved there. Uh, they did that in Sweden between 19, I think it was 1951 to 1991. And that was known as the Rhein-Mendel model. The rhein Mendel. Oh, I'm, I'm butchering European language here. I do apologize. I'm sorry as well. I mean, I, I, do, this, I do think we need to we need to study financiations a lot more. Like, like when I we're know. talking about I'll, I'll, international I'll, programs. I'll just judge my Scott, basically. It's just my R's. But, um, <laughs> but uh, basically, that the, the Swedish model, though, was fantastic because, well, it was basically aimed at tackling wage policy uh, by looking at low inflation, full employment, high growth, and inequality. Uh, unemployment for, the last, for about four decades in Sweden always remained about under 3%. Mm. Uh, but the reason it was employer last resort was that it was a unions that negotiated uh, with the government and with private sector about the actual uh, wage and income which workers would receive. And if workers, after a period amount of time, I think it was about six months, if they were not covered well enough by the welfare state or did not uh, receive employment by the private sector, the state had to guarantee them a job after six months. All of that was negotiated through unions. And it was a, it was a completely fantastic program. Now, during the 70s, when you had the oil crisis and the kind of the crisis of Keynesianism and, mm -hmm. and the left-wing governments, uh, Sweden held off from the, uh, the kind of economic turmoil many European states faced and actually tried to hold on to its Keynesian roots. Obviously, didn't last forever though because in you know 1991 the the, the model was scrapped mm -hmm. and from we went from under three percent unemployment and jumped up to ten percent in 1993 and since then Sweden has not gone really below three percent of unemployment since it's always been stuck between four to seven percent that's all because mm -hmm. The private sector white collars basically lobbied right wing parties and also centrist, centrist parties too to try and bring more private sector influence to increase their profit margins instead of focusing on uh, labour and focusing on the main targets of uh, full employment, low inflation, high growth and income equality. Some of these targets are dropped purely for the sake of uh, profit margins increasing. Yeah, so, uh, so when it comes to, uh, to state guaranteeing a job, do you think, do you think this model could work um, with, um, with, with individual communities or, or would it have to be like more state-led or something like that? I think, well, that's one of, the, one of the main pillars with the job guarantee is that it has to be a localised model. If it's not a localised model, then it, it's likely that the state will not give out people-oriented work. And I think when it comes to my, pa when it comes to my paper, and the paper has also been co-written by a colleague called Craig Berry, we look at four bodies which will effectively uh, help run the job guarantee. Now, this is from a Scottish perspective, so this is going to have Scottish names to it, but this also applies to the UK too, and they can apply a similar model. So first of all, you'd have uh, the Scottish Employment Agency, which is pronounced SEMA. So they would basically direct the whole programme from a national level and make sure that key, key targets are actually met. So they manage national infrastructure available for the job guarantee programme, and they also coordinate data between different uh, regional groups so that if a certain area needs uh, certain resources or certain uh, labor to help carry a certain program or a certain uh workforce or project uh, that can be shared with other sectors or sorry other regional areas which uh, can share or redistribute that labor or that income obviously it's much harder to redistribute labor but uh, redistributing resources is far easier um and also as well SEMA would also be uh, responsible for liaising with local councils and, re and rents but we'll get to the rent in a second uh, yeah. but also meeting making but more importantly uh, the Scottish Employment Agency has to make sure that people-oriented objectives are being met because if, if the people-oriented sector part is not being met, then it's fundamentally undermining what the original programme is. Yeah, so um, I do, I do want to ask more about the local, um, about the local council involvement, obviously, because because the because the situation in my local council right now is not the best. Because uh, I don't know if you've heard, but we've had um, we've had two councils resign, and uh, and now and now it's a hung council. So like both the so um, so I think what's happened now is is that the Labour Party and the Conservative Party kind of have to work together. So um, so would that be something that could work in a hung council, do you think? 
I think ultimately what matters is is the Hung Council respects the wishes of local community and what kind of employment they wish to seek. So what you would do there is you basically cr create, and this is, this is a Scottish thing, but you can create a community employment committee, which is, is essentially is a democratically coordinated and elected uh, body which has local community members come together uh, and it might not even be elected actually, you could maybe just open it for people to come in and discuss uh, the kind of community job jobs they want to be represented with the overall uh, budget uh, in terms of local councils. Um, basically, you can actually tie in participatory budgeting in this actually, which currently we have in Scotland, which is about 1% of overall uh, council budgeting overall, uh, which is basically communities, communities come together, they deliberate when it comes to decision making, and they just put forward their main concerns or their main goals for what they want to see this year. Um, so I think actually for the Scottish government, actually, it's about £100 million at cost. So actually, uh, participa participatory budgeting isn't actually that expensive whatsoever. Uh, now, if you tie that in with the Crowley example for, as you stated, and you have a hung council, the question ult ultimately is, will Labour and the Tories listen to the community employment committees? And uh, if, the, let's say Labour does, Labour says, Labour says, actually, we, we respect the wishes of these committees. They wish to have uh, new jobs within X, Y, and Z sectors, and we're going to try and create that with a statement programme and redistribute resources. If the Tories said no to that, they are they're directly uh, going against the wishes of constituents, which in politics, if you're doing it so directly, there's going to be a backlash in later elections. That just won't work. So what you'd most likely see is that Labour and the Conservatives, if obviously as a home council, they'll have to work together. They may have to negotiate about what the community employment committees maybe say to, or maybe they actually just completely endorse uh, what is put forward. But again, no, this depends on if the projects are uh, doable. Uh, at all, uh, because this is why we also have the regional employment network, which is REN, which I mentioned earlier, and that's basically head teams of specialists who will lead the projects and who will lead the job guarantee in local areas to see if it can actually uh, be doable in the first place, to yeah. see if the performances can actually help uh, labour and people oriented work. Yeah, because, um, we, yeah, because sorry, yeah, because when uh, yeah, because like, when it comes to like. Uh, like local communities and like when it comes to like local towns like uh like most towns are different lots of um are really different and and one of the campaigns that we are leading right now um with uh with my trade union with unite is that is that a lot of a lot of um of gatwick airport jobs on are, are not being protected and uh, and a lot of um aviation jobs are really like in the air at the moment with like british airways threatening to pull out and like and like and other companies announcing massive redundancies like Virgin and and um, uh, and, and even before the crisis we uh, we saw um, we saw airlines going bust uh, like Thomas uh, like Thomas Cook and like Ryanair as well I think so so would this be something that could like um, like be um, uh, accustomed to like different communities as well like and like change like to sort out different communities because obviously obviously Crawley um, is very is very like, reliant on the on the aviation um, aviation sort of, of sector because because of how close you are to Gatwick Airport. So like, would that be accustomed to like different communities which are not so reliant on that sector? If that community wants to protect a certain sector of work uh, and they push forward that and uh, their CECs, and that would be protected if the state is willing to go out the way to do it. And through the job guarantee, that's what would happen. But the job guarantee within itself. Uh, would extend new sectors within the local community which people want to actually see. So it's actually creating kind of almost a rainbow of different skills and ideas within it, if that's what the community wants. So again, it's all about people orientation and it's all about being people led. And that purely depends on your local community. And that's what the big point of it is. It's about putting together uh, your local economy and local democracy hand in hand together and not separating them between a state and local level. Uh, where you, you often see a political struggle between the two. And it's about direct power to individual people. And you actually spoke about um, the unemployment there from uh, the aviation sector before and after the crisis. 
I think this is a good point to point out that the job guarantee operates in a counter cyclical manner. So for example, if wages are rising and there's new jobs being created in the private sector, the job guarantee actually shrinks automatically because workers will move for better pay and opportunities, usually if those opportunities are there and match their skill sets. And it's about putting pressure on the private sector to meet the needs of people and having people earn employment whilst they also uh, meet their profit margins. But if there's a recession, obviously the private sector is going to have to let go of a lot of people or wages will be cut and therefore the quality of life uh, is going to decline very quickly. Yeah, and I that's think... what happens when that's what happens when you have the job guarantee. It's a buffer stock. So the job guarantee will uh, take in all those who've been suddenly left unemployed within the with, within the recession. Yeah. And then they're consumed and then it stabilizes their wages and their consumption as well because they still have that income there in the end. So it's an auto stabilizer. So in terms of recession, the government spending goes up. And when it comes to near full employment and the economic boom, government spending goes down. Yeah, yeah. When it comes to um, when it comes to a recession, obviously, obviously, since the crisis and first hit in like early March and, and we've known about and we've known about the coronavirus since um since early january i think um it's it is very uncertain times right now like when it comes to like, employment and and like what is um what is considered safe employment right now and, and a lot of people are working from home uh, some people are still being furloughed uh, and uh, i know lots of people who are in all sorts of situations like being furloughed uh, as well which is um which is uh, which is which is a very good government scheme but um i think um I'm not sure for how much longer that will be going on, uh, and um, I'm working. I'm working from home as well. We have seen um, a rise up. So, so would that be something that the job guarantee could uh, could take into account? The job. Well, the problem with uh, COVID nineteen is we can't enter the workplace uh, because of the of the actual virus itself, and therefore by putting people in the workplace when it's unsafe can risk lives and risk spreading it and therefore lead to further deaths. So that's where the job guarantee is obviously limited. The job guarantee isn't a, you know, a magic wand that will fix everyone's problems. It's just one part of the jigsaw that has to come in with many other policies with it. Um, so it obviously, from what you've mentioned there, uh, it's quite limited. But when we're back in a situation where people kind of re-enter the workplace, uh, the job guarantee is a buffer, is a buffer stock. It, it's there when people need it. Uh, and also it sets the bare minimum sort of standards for employment. But you also put touch on the furlough as well, which is something which a lot of people have called for to be extended. But, um, you know, we have universal basic income, which is something which I'm sort of hesitant on, but I think is actually, you know, something worth discussing anyway, though. And I think that's something which you yourself are actually quite a fan of. Yeah, yeah. When it comes to... Uh... When it comes to universal basic basic income, I uh, I have kind of um, like over the years I have kind of flip flop on it because uh, because uh, protecting because like protecting workers' incomes and protecting people's incomes like throughout like throughout this country, especially especially with especially with a crisis like COVID nineteen, I do think um, I do think UBI is something um, that should have been introduced at the start at the start of this crisis because um, because because then if a lot more people were staying home and if a lot more people had their had their incomes protected then that would have um, maybe maybe lessened the damage of COVID nineteen a lot more uh, because we would have seen obviously people shielding a lot more and people having the means to and and I. I guess I guess this whole situation with COVID has has exposed a lot with like what is what is actually wrong with the capitalist system right now because um, because obviously it puts it puts profits before before people's lives and it and it doesn't and it doesn't take into um, account uh, like situations like COVID and 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 I think it's it I think COVID has completely has completely exposed um, a lot, a lot of what is wrong with the whole capitalist system, and uh, and why we need a lot, a lot of um, of a radical change. And like we've seen how, and we've seen how um, how different countries have handled have handled the crisis, and like and like how some countries have gotten off a lot better than other countries because yes, because they because they have had governments that have taken early action and they also had governments which protected workers incomes everyone and, income. 
and we've also uh, what I might had allow is for businesses to basically cut into uh, people, kind of uh, workers' kind of wages uh, and also potential other benefits. Uh, and, at this, and, this, and if we have a conservative state, they might cut into the welfare state, they come out other people's welfare uh, benefits as well. And basically, it might turn us into kind of more consumerist, basically. Yeah, so I do. Um, yeah, I do definitely take that argument on board about about um, about if the conservatives came in, then they would probably do something like that. So then, so I guess um, one way around that was that you could um, you could obviously legislate for for a higher minimum wage as well as like um, as um, as like a add on to what you what you what you already getting from UBI, and therefore we're just going to spend and spend and spend into private corporations and basically we're feeling profits for private business basically that's so that's the argument putting forward we're going to come into crazy consumerists who only care about spending to buy to fuel ourselves with uh just goods for ourselves but, then, but then, uh, i do think i do think that ubi would would actually increase the would actually increase the economy because because like when you when you put more money into 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 the um into the pockets of the workers then they're then they are actually get and then they are actually getting more to spend so then that would um so then that would obviously generate the economy because of all the because of because of all the extra transactions and and then and then and then that would obviously give more funding to to local communities and to more and and to more independent businesses to then to then create more jobs and and then to basically generate more um more for local communities which is one thing that i really like about it the multiplier effect basically so yeah. it multiplies jobs and growth i guess another question is then um and i guess you have an answer to this definitely because uh you could labor put kind of ideas of how to pay for their programs on their last manifesto is how would you pay for a ubi then from your perspective yeah when um how how i would pay for ubi was um obviously in um in in corbyn's last manifesto what um what he was talking about was was um was putting up corporation tax uh, from what i've also been told is a lot of people who advocate for UBI make the argument that a lot of people's jobs are going to be taken over by like robots basically so that production lines are far less people oriented and more machine oriented yeah. and that they, they create greater production than humans themselves uh, what what would you say to that kind of argument yeah, I mean, even, even if you support UBI what do you say to that specific thing yeah like, I do think uh, I do think because we are in 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 a transition of actually going to more jobs being being automated and we and we are seeing and we are seeing a lot more machines in the workplace a lot of industries are going are going completely um are going completely uh redundant anyway so i think so i think if we if we weren't going to um have those jobs because because of automation i think um i don't think ubi would definitely um take a lot of of the pressure off people when it when it comes to automation right okay and i guess um I guess what another thing I've heard. This is I've not heard this from a left wing friend, but this is more like a right wing argument here. But um, I guess you're sort is, of trying to play the devil's advocate, uh, the devil's. Hey, I, I'm just feeding back what I'm told. Okay, I, I, this is not my view. Okay, this is this is definitely not my view. This one here. So, uh, but I, I want to hear your response to this one though. So, the idea. And this is a classic argument for like almost any kind of welfare program. But it's the idea that. If we take UBI, we'll become really lazy. We won't do anything, won't be productive, uh, and we'll just basically stay at home. That's kind of the classic Tory argument that basically it's a, it's a lazy way of earning in, unearned income. And they use the term unearned as if we don't deserve it. What would you say to that kind of response? From yeah, I guess... Everything? I guess that when it comes to this whole unearned um, wealth uh, wealth argument, I've I I I have heard this um, uh, said by conservatives like my entire life. But the but like the whole essence of wealth is that you can't you can't become a millionaire without exploiting the working class, and you can't become a billionaire without exploiting the working class and and society does need to be a lot more a lot more equal and 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 wealth distribution is just 
it's just a huge part of that I, I think and and yeah I and and a lot of those arguments are just just about like making like democracy statements like the working class and yeah that i i i kind of have heard that a lot uh, yeah i mean i think as well when, when i think about ubi a lot of people unironically say oh yeah what next universal basic dogs or what <laughs> universal basic video games and then, but then the further they go though i think the further they go though they start saying stuff like what next universal basic services and then suddenly people go Yes, <laughs> that's, a kind of, that's a kind of a good idea, actually. Yeah, yeah. yeah I think. Uh, yeah, I mean, like, universal basic universal basic services is the right thing to do. And in the last and in the last manifesto, we we promised national education service, and we promised the national and we promised. When, when we you promised, say we, you labour. Yes. Yeah. I'm, yeah. Uh, I'm an <laughs> <SMG guy> here. <clears throat> but yeah, yeah, but yeah. Um, so like when the whole argument is well what's next this and that i'm like yes that is what's next that is what should happen like like a national education service like a national edu um uh national care service um ju just how it's modeled on just how it's modeled on the on the national health service it's like what's next that yes <laughs> yes that mm -hmm. should be what's next the, the big thing as well about um universal basic services is when you give people the power to travel pretty much anywhere for free or at least very far in the local community they have far greater access to services and if those services such as education such as health uh, are free as well then basically they are getting greater uh, greater access to resources to knowledge uh, and they're also uh, meeting their needs and wants to aspire to be something greater in society. If they if they want to go to university, or if they want to go, or even to go to high school or college, and if they can access these facilities as well, uh, not only do, does our human abilities and, and, and social life in, increase in terms of our of, of health, but, but also its happiness as well, but also as well it reduces crime because a lot of crime is very localized. The lack of resources and a lack yeah. of opportunity available, and therefore people result in having to commit crime to take on resources which they cannot have right now. Yeah, I think that's yeah, I think uh, thing uh, opportunities, even though yeah. if it's not directly, that's what that's what it's doing in the long run. Yeah, we've seen. I mean, over over the last ten years, we've seen um, we've seen obviously austerity, and and we've seen youth um, youth services uh, being closed, um, libraries being closed. Like like we have seen like the full effect of austerity, and we've seen, and and we have seen youth crime rise, and and not and not only youth crime, we've seen uh, like. But like we have a huge like stabbing problem in like the whole in like the whole um in like the whole country and like when it comes to light knife crime and like when it comes to crime in general i think uh, i think the best way to tackle crime in general is to basically give people more opportunities is basically is basically to give people more opportunity in life and that does come with more funding for was for local services protecting people's incomes and giving people a guaranteed income especially especially like when it comes to uh especially when it comes to the, like this pandemic that we're suffering now mm, actually yeah i think the pandemic will be quite interesting to see kind of the uh the crime rates i mean obviously this data collection is really hard right now due to the fact we're in a pandemic but i'd like to see where that's gone and at least a short term but as we're kind of coming into the end of this kind of first episode of the podcast this can make me think of um a meme that elon musk tweeted out i don't know i don't know if you saw this <laughs> no, but basically elon yeah elon i don't follow musk him on twitter <laughs> That I don't, I don't, I don't either. Him. I don't either. That I, I do not follow him either. On no, 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 no. Trust me, I don't follow him either for the good reasons. Trust me. But um, <laughs> he tweeted out a photo, basically going, "Das Kapital" in a nutshell. Basically, it's a picture of Marx going, "Give me that for free." Uh, and underneath it is "Hungry Santa" because he's calling uh, Karl Marx "Hungry Santa." And I thought, I thought to myself, you know, obviously he's taking the piss out of Karl Marx, basically, and he's obviously, you know, he obviously is just a bit of a numpty, the guy. But I thought to myself. Is, that's totally true. That's totally that's a legit point. Give me that for free, and that should. Uh, this is the kind of the main 
guess, point of this entire episode, but not just necessarily free. The idea that things should be universal, the very basics in society. Yeah, I guess. Uh, feel a healthy lifestyle should be universal for everyone to take on. Yeah, I guess. I guess that's the whole argument against socialism, isn't it? People like, oh yeah, everything for free. But but I don't think. But but like the whole essence of socialism is basically uh, like communities taking power over over their production of wealth, and also. And also, like when it comes to like uh, like free like free education, like free health, and um, and and free basic services, is that people are already paying taxes, right? People people are already paying taxes, so like people deserve to like people deserve to basically have those taxes back in those in those things as well. And 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 as we see the conservatives like um like they they have slashed corporation tax so much like it's now at like 17 percent now and i think i think at the height of the last gave at the height of the last of the last labor government it was like 20 percent or like 25 percent or something like that and it's it's basically um that's that and it's basically like hoarding wealth as well like when you when you when you like cut, uh, when you cut tax for the riches, that that is what happens. So like the the like correlation of wealth and and this whole trickle down argument as well does not work. Like I I have heard the whole trickle down argument. Like oh, if you give more money to these people, then 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 somehow it will trickle down to the others. That's that that's that's not how it works. Like if you give more money to those people, then they will hoard it. The best way to generate the economy is to put is to put money in is is to give more money to the working class that's I, that's the best mm. way to generate the economy i think in economics what we call that is mar- the marginal propensity to consume yeah. which that that the mpc basically measures how much extra someone will spend if you give them increased disposable income yeah and it's basically as you said with the mpc measure that the rich basically they don't at all uh, invest in new jobs or in new projects or or just in any other benefits towards working class people. They yeah. basically just hoard it into shares, stocks, and assets for themselves. Yeah. Uh, and which yeah. in itself actually cr- increases um, uh, the, the asset inflation, um, which isn't really infl- the same sort of like normal inflation. But basically, when the val- prices go up for these sort of some, in certain sectors, it actually locks out working class people because they're investing it. The wealthiest are investing in their own assets and not into actual private economies yeah. into actual work and actual workforce yeah, yeah. But, um, i don't know um i don't know if you've seen it but one of um but i think i think a year ago for the local elections uh the, the labor party did a really good did a really good political broadcast on this about about how um about how um wealth distribution actually works and they and they did have two scenarios where they gave, uh, um, where they showed is, what is, would is this, is this the one in the gym, in the gym hall, where they give it like a, a tax cut to the billionaire? And yes, also like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah, have seen that. Yeah. Actually, I'm an SMB guy, but I have to admit that's a really, that's a really <laughs> yeah. good video, yeah. So yeah. Just for the listeners, sorry, sorry, I interrupted you there, but just for the listeners, explain what that video is again, though. Yeah, yeah so, so the broadcast is basically demonstrating what would happen if you gave, if you gave an extra 20, if you gave an extra 20,000 pounds in form, in um in form of a tax cut to 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 a billionaire and what ended up happening was he just uh was he just hoarded it and then and then basically basically nothing happened but then uh, but then they showed you what would happen if you if you obviously gave more disability support for disabled people if you gave more student loans to to students and if you gave and if you gave uh, a pay rise to um to to uh, a public sector worker what what actually happened was that they were actually generating more income because basically they were using the extra money they were given like like to buy food locally to um to uh, to basically get re- to basically get repairs on their car so they could do more work as well and th- so that is that is that is the whole that is the whole essence of how trickle does not work at all so it's a very a good video. I say this as an SNP member as well. The only thing I'd say, the only thing I'd say is, let's right, hope you don't get suspended for this. Nah, nah, it's fine. It's fine. 
I, I, I've said in the past, this is a come off point as well, but I've also said I love the Green Party uh, broadcast from 2015. Oh, the, the, the change the tune. Yeah, change the change tune. The tune. Yeah. Austerity, austerity. That is actually one like, of the best. That is actually one of the best political broadcasts I've ever seen in my life. Yeah. I think, I, I, yeah. I, we're, that's it. We're, we're both now suspended from the parties now. That's it. <laughs> we'll have to join the Greens. There we go. Whoops. The only actually, thing I'd say, right? The only thing I'd say about um, the, the the broadcast talking about the Labour one, right, is that, and this is my inner MMT, and we'll discuss this maybe in another episode, but taxes don't actually pay for public spending, technically speaking, right? But I'm, gonna, I'm not going to go into detail because that's, that's a whole <laughs> thing. But apart from that, though, right, apart from that, right, that video was still really, really good, though, overall. Yeah, I, yeah. Honestly, what, what were you going to say there, Bobby? Yeah, yeah, that, uh, that, uh, that green... That Green Party podcast, uh, that broadcast, I, uh, I think I did a YouTube video reacting to it like a year ago, and yeah, that's hey, you. yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that, great though. Yeah, yeah, that was. I think that was when Miliband was the leader of the Labour Party. So yes, so um, yeah. So uh, so obviously they weren't they weren't that um, that more uh, that economically left wing as they were under Corbyn because under uh, under Miliband we were still promising. Uh, austerity and and we were still trying to appeal to right wingers with the controls on with the controls of immigration mug and yeah <laughs> not great. But I think it was a good year as well because Nicola was the left of uh of Ed and you know <laughs> yeah Nicola we still have Nicola we're going pretty short anyway I'm not going to run uh, well, <laughs> well there are there are a few things I could talk about when it comes Let, to that MP. that could <laughs> that could be a different uh, before before we end it there right I've got a question for you okay if you had to rank UBI the job guarantee and universal basic services in order from uh, favorite to least favorite I mean they're all good but if you had to order rank them from best to least best uh how would you rank them personally um well how i'd rank them is what's what's more what's the most important and the most important is definitely protecting people's livelihoods and 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 i do think that is the most important so i guess i would probably rank uh i would probably rank ubi then then the job guarantee and then and then universal fake services how would you rank them Ooh, I would actually rank it a bit differently. I would rank it. Uh, well, always say I'm completely biased because I'm writing a paper on this. So one, you, you should link your paper in the video description. It's, it's not ready yet. It's going oh. through so many tweaks okay. and stuff, but it's not. Okay, we'll link though. the resources. We'll link the resources that you. I can I can link an article I wrote for Bella. But the first okay. one I'd put is job guarantee. The second one I'd put is universal basic services, and then the third one would be UBI, basically. Um, but I guess we can maybe debate that. Like we could actually debate them another time. Yeah, but, I think. Know, either, either, but as I said at the beginning, though, I think regardless of your views on all three of them, the ultimately everyone who backs each policy all fundamentally have the, the same values and ultimately want the same thing in the end. Yeah, I, I think, think what's really important is that we don't waste our time, don't fight each other too much on it. We should have healthy debate, yeah. But ultimately, at the end of the day. Uh, those on the left and also centre left need to come together and really push for that kind of united sort of vision for what it is we want to achieve in the long term. Yeah. Uh, regardless, values are the same. Yeah. Yeah, because it's because like when it comes to left, I mean, we all have the same values, and 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 all of those policies do 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 necessarily um like uh, do 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 necessarily um link to the same thing, like they. Like they all link to basically protecting people's way of life, and and yeah. I mean, look at us. I mean, the left can be divided, but you're in Labour. I'm in the SNP, <laughs> and we're we've got a podcast. Look at us. <laughs> but anyway, I think uh, I think we have to end it there. How do yeah. we how do we end this? How do we end this now? Um, we... just say thanks for watching. Goodbye. <laughs> all right. Okay. Uh, thanks for watching and goodbye. Now we insert jazz theme. Now. <laughs> <laughs>